Hey, Slider Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. Thanks for being here. In this segment, I want to talk about ivermectin and why the left is freaking out about it all the time. The real story here is why people don't trust the experts. Why would we, right? Why do, why do you know, the people are, oh, why don't, why don't people trust the politicians? Why don't they trust our health officials? Why don't they trust Fauci? Why don't they trust the media? Well, ivermectin is a really good example. All right, let's start this with the, uh, this uh, Rolling Stone article, right? Here's the original headline of Rolling Stone just the other day. Gunshot victims left waiting as horse dewormer overdoses overwhelm Oklahoma hospital, doctor says. So there's so many people. Here's a quote from the, the story here, but the, the gist of it is there's so many people in the hospital who took ivermectin, a horse dewormer, you stupid idiot Trump supporters. Why are you taking a horse medicine, you idiots? And they're filling up the hospitals so that real victims can't even get help. Even gunshot victims are coming in and can't get the help that they need. Now, this could come out right now because we got a lot to do today. Everything in this story is a lie. <laughs> Every single possible part of this story is a lie. Let's start with calling it a horse dewormer. The guy who invented ivermectin won the Nobel Prize for inventing it in 2015. I told them, I, well, I, said, I said, you know, the guy who invented ivermectin won a Nobel Prize. And she said, for that? <laughs> like, it's not like he won it for something else. Like, no, 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 he won it for inventing ivermectin. Humans have been given four billion doses of ivermectin all around the world, four billion. So not only is it not a horse medicine and humans have taken it, four billion <laughs> <laughs> times humans have taken it. The WHO has it on their list of essential medicines for humans. To call it a horse dewormer is to call oatmeal horse food. Saying, oh, uh, every morning Slater feeds his kids horse food. Better call Child Protective Services. He's feeding his kids horse food. I'm like, oh, well, I mean, they eat oatmeal every but I, like, do you call oatmeal? I mean, horses eat oatmeal, I get, right? But I, I wouldn't call it horse food. I mean, yeah, there's types of ivermectin that are used in horses, but it's not a horse medicine, right? I mean, there's, there's, if you take an aspirin, there's aspirins for dogs, but no one calls it a dog medicine. That's the same game that they're playing here. The FDA sent out this tweet a couple weeks ago, you're not a horse, you're not a cow. Seriously, y'all, stop it. Okay, so that's the FDA saying stop taking ivermectin. But the FDA's own website has a section for refugees. It's a section in their website of, of medicines that are recommended for refugees before and after they come to the United States. And one of the, recommenda one of the recommendations is that refugees take ivermectin. Well, I thought it was a horse medicine. The FDA is mocking people for taking ivermectin when they themselves recommend that people take ivermectin. People that come from the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, says take two doses of ivermectin before you even arrive. Why are, why are we feeding refugees horse medicine, FDA? Why, FDA, why do you want to give horse dewormer to brown people, huh? Now you say, oh, well, Slater, this section of the FDA recommendation, it's, under, it's underneath the section for intestinal parasites. And that was my take, too. I was like, okay, so I'd, all right, fine. So ivermectin, uh, humans take it. But it's not for viruses. It's for worms. <laughs> but it turns out ivermectin is also used to treat 21 different viruses. And there are over 70 trials going on right now looking at ivermectin's effectiveness on COVID. That's a big deal. Trials cost a lot of money, a lot of time. A lot of people dedicating their lives to studying a thing, hopefully for the benefit of mankind and the benefit of medicine, right? So in this case, they're deciding, there's all these people spending time and money and energy, opportunity costs, they could be doing something else, but they're studying the use of ivermectin at treating COVID. 70 studies right now. And the media still calls it a horse dewormer. Do you see how insane that is? And then they wonder why we don't trust them. Back to that Rolling Stones article, the uh, hospital, right? This is about an Oklahoma hospital. The hospital wrote back. 
And they said, that guy, the doctor, your source, hasn't worked here in over two months. Oh, and by the way, we've never treated a single person from ivermectin overdose. So not only are we, is our hospital not full because of people overdosing on ivermectin, we've never treated a single person with ivermectin. Not one. And we've never turned anyone away from you know, gunshot victims or anyone else coming and looking for treatment. The entire article was a lie, every single thing about it. Even the picture that they chose to use in the Rolling Stone story is people waiting in line. Now you look at this, and if you're not really paying attention, you're just scrolling through things quickly, you look at this picture and you, know, you presume that it's people waiting in line for emergency room treatment. Right? Here's, here's like the emergency room overflow. Wow, look at all those people. Like, they, those are the people that can't get treatment because of the stupid idiot Trump supporters took ivermectin. And then you look at it closer, you're like, wait, why are they wearing coats? It's 97 degrees in Oklahoma today. Oklahoma today is a high of 97. <laughs> why is everyone bundled up? Oh, you, sure, sure enough, that's, a, that's from months ago. That's people standing in line for the vaccine. Even the picture was a lie. Now we have a little before and after because they changed the headline, right? After they were outed. It's not even out, like after it turns out that the whole thing was a lie, Rolling Stone changed the headline around. But look at the difference between the before and after, right? So the original tweet had six and a half thousand retweets. Right? Like, look at these idiots, oh, Trump supporters, blah, 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 ivermectin, horse medicine, blah, blah. and then the new corrected only has 300 retweets. That's the danger of spreading false information up front. Everyone wants the sensational thing in the beginning. No one wants the uh, truth. <laughs> they call it an update. They call it a, a you know, updated story. <laughs> like, well, the update is nothing we said is true. This is uh, NPR. The podcast host, Joe Rogan, who has dismissed COVID vaccines, said he tested positive and has taken a cocktail of unproven treatments, including ivermectin, a deworming drug for cows that the FDA warns people should not ingest. Nothing in there about Nobel Prize, nothing in there about the FDA saying you should ingest it, uh, nothing, nothing about it's a human medicine, it's just a deworming drug now for cows. They're trying to find out which cows or horses are more disparaging for people to take, right? So these are the people you're supposed to trust. And as we're going to talk about in the next segment, and then Lila Rose coming up, these are also the people that tell you men can give birth and a baby's just a clump of cells. Same people. Wall Street Journal wrote an opinion piece, or published an opinion piece, by a guy who works at Stanford, and then a guy who works at a, some company that works with pharmaceutical companies to, uh, like, with the FDA and whatever. And the headline was, uh, you know, why is the FDA attacking a safe, effective drug? The FDA approved ivermectin for humans in 1996. So what gives? What, why are they attacking it? And these guys went on, and this is super interesting. They said uh, that ivermectin, uh, a single dose, has in one of the studies that they've done so far, of the more than 70 they have right now, one single dose of ivermectin has reduced the viral load of COVID in cells by 99.8% in just 24 hours. 99.8% reduction in viral load in just 24 hours. That was a stu study done last June 2020. Now listen, I haven't read these studies. Yesterday we did a bunch of studies about masks, and I've read all those. I haven't read these studies about ivermectin. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. I'm not telling you to take it or not take it. I don't know, right? But definitely push back on the media response of, oh, you idiot, right? That's where I threw the flag. I was like, wait a second. What's going on here? One study, this drug was given to family members of people who got COVID, right? So, so someone in your family gets COVID, and then they give you, they give everyone else in the family ivermectin. And of the families they did that, only 8% of people became infected with COVID. In the control group, 59% of the family members got COVID. That's a big difference. So what gives? Why the hatred? I think the root of it is, 
Similar to hydro hydroxychloroquine, right? Hydroxychloroquine, the left had to come out and hate because Trump said maybe, possibly, it might be something that's kind of good. I don't know. We'll see. It was like the most nuanced statement President Trump's ever said. It's like maybe uh, HCQ will kind of work. We'll see. We hope. We're doing studies. We'll give you the latest. We don't know. And uh, immediately, it was like, oh, hydroxychloroquine, and people are dying because they took it. It took out. The, it turns out that the guy drank uh, fish tank cleaner, <laughs> right? But the media had to paint it as if Trump's killing people with his uh, his bogus medical advice. Similar here too, right? But it's a little bit different because Trump's not president anymore. The hatred of ivermectin is because the left is so obsessed. Their cult is so obsessed with masks, but also the vaccine. That's like that's like their religious emblem or idol is, is the vaccine. Like you have you have to take the vaccine. You must take the vaccine. No other treatment will ever be acceptable. You must get the vaccine. So if someone comes in and says, oh, here's this other medicine or pill or something that will treat COVID, no, we will not allow that. We only will allow the vaccine. No other treatment is allowed to even be looked at. It must be mocked and ridiculed. It's a horse dewormer. Any medicine that now is any therapeutic that comes around is gonna be demeaned in some way. Horse de dewormer, cow dewormer, whatever. They are entirely focused on getting people vaccinated. Nothing else will be allowed. This is why they don't talk about natural immunity anymore, right? People who already have the antibodies. This is why they don't talk about survival rates for healthy young people. This is why they don't talk about any other treatments or therapeutics. This is why they trash Joe Rogan for taking all these medicines after he got COVID. Because to them, you must get vaccinated multiple times for the rest of your life. Uh, Israel is now talking about a fourth dose Okay, you're never gonna be fully vaccinated. That's what this is part of their cult, right? They're, you're never gonna be fully vaccinated. You thought you were fully vaccinated after two doses. Nope, you need a booster. Now that third is fully vaccinated. In Israel, they're talking about a fourth is fully vaccinated. You're never going to be fully vaccinated. Just like in religion, you can never be good enough, right? That's their cult. And their obsession is so deep. Their cult is so deep that they won't let you go to stores. They won't let you go to restaurants. They won't let you fly on airplanes. They won't let you be a part of normal society until you comply. Uh, Australia, you know, they have lockdowns. We all have lockdowns. The, one of the, the premiers of Victoria, it's like a governor basically, he said, uh, we're going to go from lockdowns to lockouts. Lock out. If you're not vaccinated, you're locked out of the economy. That's what he said. And they will destroy anyone who gets in their way. But also trust them. should always trust them. Because they have your best interests in. Coming up next, uh, we'll give you the latest on that abortion law in, uh, in Texas, and then the wonderful Lila Rose is going to be coming up as well. First, I want to tell you about a new book. We've got a uh, new book from best-selling author Vince Flynn, Enemy at the Gates, a Mitch Rapp thriller. Uh, CIA counterterrorism agent Mitch Rapp, if you've never read any of his books before or this character before, uh, 13 of Flynn's political thrillers, all of them New York Times bestsellers. Right? I mean, so... <laughs> Just like, how can you do that? How can you constantly write amazing books like this? Right. So grab your copy today and uh, follow the CIA's top operative as he searches for a high-level mole with the power to rewrite the world order. The reviews are amazing. Publishers Weekly said it's uh, outstanding and uh, Flynn's just at the top of his game. So go get it. Enemy at the Gates, Vince Flynn, wherever books are sold. True story. Thanks later. Spread the word. Hey, Slider Crusaders, I came across this Margaret Thatcher quote yesterday, and I think it ties very nicely into everything we talk about, quite frankly, but also in this, uh, this next topic here. So she's talking about uh, the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire and why they ultimately fell, obviously, keeping in mind ours as well. This is what she said. In the end, they, more than freedom, wanted security. They wanted a comfortable life. And they lost it all, security, comfort, and freedom. When the Athenians finally wanted 
not to give to society, but for society to give to them. When the freedom they wished for most was freedom from responsibility, then Athens ceased to be free and was never free again. It's that last line that really stands out. The freedom they wanted more than anything was freedom from responsibility. And that is, that, that, that answers and explains so much of so many of the problems that we have today in our culture. Coming up, we're going to talk with Lila Rose about the abortion law in Texas and the Supreme Court. This is all a big preview. I should say a preview for the big case in the Supreme Court, uh, Dobbs v. Jackson, which is going to be oral arguments in November, probably decided in May or June. And that case is the, re the real and I would argue maybe even the last chance to get rid of Roe v. Wade in America. Let me start here. Keeping in mind throughout this time the freedom from responsibility. What we need on this topic, and really many more too, is we need more hate and more love. We need conviction. God hates. <laughs> By the way, that should be known. God hates idolatry. He hates those who do evil. He hates pride, hates lying, murder, sexual perversion, child sacrifice that's specifically in there. God hated Esau before he was even born. Proverbs 6 talks about six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. So God hates. We need to increase our hatred of sin. Our sin, everyone's sin, sin in general, and specifically in this case, the act of abortion. We are way, way, way too wishy-washy on it. We're way too, uh, oh, well, you know, who am I to say, teach his own, about killing babies, you know. No, we need to hate it with a passion. And we need way more love. Love for the woman who thinks that this is something that will improve her life or feels so trapped and just so whatever, all the things that would lead her to go against her very nature, the most natural of all natural things, which is to protect life. So we need way more love as well. And that's why I want to inspire you to Google your town and then pro-life pregnancy center because your town has one and they're the opposite of Planned Parenthood's. And they have a lot of love there. Every church in this country should be full of single moms. Churches should be packed to the brim of single moms who are getting the love and support they need for having made the choice of life or not. So instead, they ran into the loving arms of Planned Parenthood. And that's a stain on the church. The amount of abortion we have in this country is over 600,000 a year. It's because of the failure of so-called Christians to have a conviction on this issue. On this issue, There's not enough hate. There's not enough love. Too much being nice. <laughs> nice is that middle road, right? Like nice. Nice is, the, nice is everything got to be nice. Above all, be nice. I just want to be nice, right? You ask someone what the gospel is and they'll say, oh, it's about being nice. I just want to be nice. I want to be a nice guy. Seriously, you ask most Christians what the gospel is. Gospel means good news. You ask people what the good news is and they'll say, you got to be nice. Love your neighbor. Be nice. Be a nice guy. Be very nice. It's so important to be nice. Are you with me? You got to be nice. Above all else, be nice. Well, how do you love your neighbor? Well, you got to be really nice. When the church's greatest goal is to be nice, you're going to get more abortions. Nice is Satan. Nice is do whatever you think is easiest in the moment. That's nice. It's an expression for a reason. The road to hell is paved with good intentions, and it's paved by nice people. Have a conviction. Stop trying to be so nice. And that goes both ways, right? Like, stop being nice. Like, call abortion for what it is. Hate it. Hate it. Stop being nice about it. Hate it. And also, nice isn't love. So get a conviction and love the people who are in a crisis pregnancy. Stop being nice. It's a cop-out. You're a coward. Nice. I'll tell you what nice looks like, right? This is Joe Biden. Here's a Christian on being nice. I respect them, they, those who believe life begins in the moment of conception and all. I, I respect that. Don't agree, but I respect that. I'm not going to impose that on people. I'm not going to impose it on people. 
I don't feel this. I, you know, I respect it. You know, just being nice. I don't want. I don't want to pose. I just want to be a nice guy about it. That's what. Go, that's what being nice is. You're a coward. I'm going to respect their opinion. Now, stop respecting people's opinions about medical fact. We don't have time today to go over. Um, it was an academic survey. University of Chicago Law School professor, 2,899 biologists. It's a survey of almost 3,000 biologists at hundreds of different universities across the country. A majority of them, a vast majority of them, were pro-abortion, pro-choice. And 95% of these biologists agreed, 95% agreed that life begins at conception. And of course it does. When else could it begin? <laughs> but Joe Biden wants to be nice. And you need to be nice. Everyone needs to be nice. Don't have a conviction about it. Be nice. Um, we got a couple minutes here before Lila Rose gets here. Super stoked. Um, let's debunk a couple of the abortion arguments that people are making today in light of the Texas case and, and what's coming up with the uh, Mississippi case. Uh, this is an abortion activist. She said, unfun fact, abortion was not a political issue in this country until the early 1970s when it was deliberately made a political issue to goad white evangelicals into voting Republican. So let's take two things here. It was not a political issue until the early uh, 1970s. Uh, no, it's not true. There was an anti-abortion advocate. His name was Horatio Storer. I went to Harvard Med School. He was an OBGYN. He lobbied the American Medical Association, the newly formed medical, American Medical Association, to come down, have a conviction, stop being so nice, have a conviction against abortion. And he was very successful. Uh, as you can tell by that gentleman, that was not taken in 1970. It was 1857. It was called uh, the Physician's Crusade Against Abortion. He and a bunch of other doctors. Right? The Physician's Crusade Against Abortion. It was the 1850s. Uh, so that part's false. The reason, however, why maybe there was an uptick in political action around this in the early 1970s might have something to do with the fact Something else related to this issue happened in the early 1970s. What could it be? Uh, what happened in the early 1970s that would have... Been, ah, yes, Roe v. Wade! 1973, when the Supreme Court, in a wildly unconstitutional way, decided to impose an extreme abortion law by court fiat out of thin air in the never-mentioned privacy clause of the Constitution that doesn't exist! That is what goaded people to political action on this topic, lady. <laughs> Jeez. All right, number two. This is uh, Cori Bush. She's a uh, black congresswoman. I say black because it's relevant here. She's crazy. Right? She sent this out. She said, I'm thinking about the black, brown, low-income, queer, and young folks in Texas, the folks this abortion health care ban will disproportionately harm, blah, blah, blah. All right, first of all, don't gloss over abortion health care. Abortion health care. Sometimes you hear abortion care. Uh, it's like anything queer. It doesn't have to do with anything. Uh, but here's the main point. It's really something. It's really something to hear a black congresswoman advocating for black genocide. The Klan approves of Congresswoman Cori Bush's messaging here. I would just imagine some, some Ku Klux Klan members uh, going to a Congresswoman Cori Bush rally, going to protest her, right? Going to talk about how you have be super racist towards her or whatever. And then they get there and they hear Cori Bush talk about how we need to abort more black kids. And the Klan all of a sudden saying, oh, well, actually, this is great. And they start writing her checks for her reelection. Cori Bush, Klan approved. Kill more black kids. Amazing. Uh, another term you'll hear a lot, and you've heard a lot, is uh, reproductive rights. Don't let people get away with that. The reproduction has already occurred. No one's forcing anyone to get pregnant. That would be reproduction rights. The reproduction's already there. The baby's been reproduced. And no one has a right to kill a distinct human being with different DNA, blood type, heartbeat, et cetera, et cetera. Not the mother, not anyone else. Hot take of the day, the state should outlaw murder. This is some uh, professor at the University of, uh, or excuse me, Washington Lee University, she's a law professor. Chris Cuomo tweeted this out as if this was some sort of like rhetorical wisdom or something. If a fetus, this is a pro-abortion person, if a fetus is a person at six weeks pregnant, which is what Texas says, is that when child support starts? 
Is that when you also can't deport the mother because she's carrying a US citizen? Can I insure a six week fetus and collect if I miscarry? Just figuring if we're going there, we should go all in. Um, okay. I accept your terms. <laughs> Deal. If I agree to those terms, if I agree that uh, you can insure a six week fetus or child support starts at six weeks in the womb, if I agree to that, which I gladly will, will you agree? Will you admit to the humanity of the baby? If I agree to those terms, will you agree to outlawing abortion? No, you won't? Okay, so what's your point? Last point. Uh, why are the Democrats so obsessed with abortion? We need to understand this. The goal of the elites, right, the academic elites leading the charge, is to end the family. The Democratic Party in our country right now is run by the feminist ideology. Feminists want to destroy masculinity, they want to destroy femininity, and they want to destroy the family. Now, the freakout that you've seen just these last couple of days from the left on this decision, it's nothing compared to what's coming with the next abortion case, which at worst for the pro-abortion people would just leave it up to the states to decide. But get ready for it. The left is going to freak out like you've never seen him freak out. It'll make the Kavanaugh hearings look like nothing because people love killing babies. It's a wild thing. They've always loved it. It's a weird thing that humans do. And societies throughout all of history have celebrated it. In ancient Rome, they called it exposure. So a newborn baby was born, and the, the parents didn't want it for whatever reason. They would put the baby in a pot, and they would go put it in a field somewhere outside. And this was totally fine. And the parents were not guilty of anything because the baby would die from hunger or asphyxiation or freeze to death. So there was no blood on the parents' hands because they didn't kill the baby with their own hands, technically. Sometimes they would just leave the baby out in the field, not in a pot. Uh, and they thought that that was even better because that gave the baby more of a chance to live. Maybe the gods would pick up the baby or some passerby may rescue the baby. And it was all out of sight, out of mind. It was called exposure. So they called it exposure. That was ancient Greece and ancient Rome. China, thousands of years ago, they would drown their newborn babies. That was seen as the way to properly do it. Uh, they, didn't, they believed that a baby wasn't a baby until six months after birth. This happened everywhere. Humans always have killed their babies because we're evil, sinful people. A regular practice all around the world in all periods of time. Of course, the Aztecs would rip the hearts out of babies as a sacrifice to their gods. Christianity came around and said, this is not so great. <laughs> but how about you stop doing this? In the Middle Ages, people would start dropping their kids off at churches. And that was the beginning of orphanages. But we kill babies today, over 600,000 a year. We're no different. In 100 years, 200 years, 500 years, someone's going to write some academic paper on the history of abortion in the world. They're going to do a survey of abortion throughout the world and killing babies throughout the world. And eventually, they'll write a chapter on America in the year around 2000. And they'll talk about how we slaughtered 600,000 babies a year. And we committed one of the worst black genocides in the history of the world. And they're going to look at us and they're going to say, how could these monsters have done such a thing? How could these monsters have done that? And how could anyone have lived in an era where people let that happen? It's the exact same feeling they're going to have. It's the exact same feeling you had, that guttural drop in your stomach. When I told you that ancient Romans used to put newborn babies in a clay pot and leave it outside to die in a field, right? Or this, this drop you have in your stomach when you think of Aztecs cutting the heart out of a live baby at the altar, right? That crushes your soul, as it should. And people 200 years from now are going to look back on us and think the exact same thing. They're going to say, what monsters? How could they have done this? How could the people have done it? And how could so many people have been silent or even complicit? How could they? And they'd be right. The wonderful Lila Rose, coming up next. Spread the word. Hey, Senator Crusaders, what happened the other day with the Texas law and the Supreme Court, that's the little taste of what's to come once Dobbs v. Jackson is going to be decided uh, coming up May or June of next year. And that's the real opportunity to get rid of Roe v. Wade. And you will see the pro-abortion people absolutely apoplectic, freaking out like nothing you've ever seen before. So we need to be ready, if you're not fully ready right now, to be the light in that moment when that happens and spreading the truth 
uh, about abortion and what to do now instead, hopefully supporting your pro -life, local pro-life pregnancies as well. Uh, I would argue the leader of the pro-life movement in this country is Lila Rose. She's the founder of Live Action, and her newest book is Fighting for Life, Becoming a Force for Change in a Wounded World. Lila, wonderful to talk to you. How are you? I'm good, Mike. Thanks for having me on. I wanted to start with the wounded world. Why is that part important? Well, first of all, the world, it's reality. The world is really wounded. With abortion, there are, in the United States alone, over 60 million kids killed by abortion since it was legalized. Globally, in the last two decades, they say it's up to 2 billion children have been killed globally in the last 20 plus years. So that's a lot of wounds, not just the deaths of those kids, but the parents, the fathers, the mothers, and just the societal harm that comes with that. But I mean, you know, original sin, I believe it exists. I think there's evil and good, and we are always in a war. What are we going to pick? Are we going to choose to do what's right or choose to do what's wrong? And so I chose Wounded World because we are wounded. Everybody has wounds, has struggles, but we can overcome and rise above that if we're willing to fight for what is good and true and beautiful. And there's nothing more good and true and beautiful than this. Uh, and I would argue wounded than this uh, on the other side. Why, why has the, the pro-abortion group lobby been so successful? How have they been so successful at silencing men in this issue? That is just one of the easiest, most cowardice fallbacks is, uh, oh, I don't, I'm not allowed to have a say on this as a man. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Well, and I so appreciate you as a man talking about this because we need men. I mean, this is not just some women's issue. It's a human issue. And half the children killed by abortion are boys. And every, every single one of those kids has a father. So men who are designed to protect, they're at their best, I think, men, when they're empowered to protect women and children and enable women to care for their children. So how did it happen? I mean, you can date it back to sort of second, third wave feminism, who said that this is just about women and, you know, had this false view of autonomy to say that my body, my choice, when really there's another body involved, you know, scientifically, logically speaking, and I don't have the right as a woman to kill my child. So I think it's just a silencing tactic uh, to try to silence a whole group of defenders of life. And thankfully, it's not working. You're speaking up. You know, there's live action. Half of our team is men. Uh, the pro-life movement is filled with brave men. So I just tell men, tell men, keep speaking, um, keep championing women and children. It's what you're, it's, just, it's what you're made for. Uh, I want to give you some of the hard ones, Lila, because no one's more prepared to do this than you. Um, if you outlaw abortion. We're gonna go back to back alley abortions, coat hangers, dangerous women dying to have their abortions. Why do you want that, Lila? Well, first of all, you can say that about any illicit activity, whether that is theft or murder or rape. I mean, yes, the law is not designed to make it easier to kill. The law should be designed to protect people from being killed. So the idea of a back alley abortion is well, first of all, no abortion is safe. You have a child in every abortion who's killed by that abortion. So there's no such thing as a safe abortion. And women die from legal abortion. Uh, you might have heard about Kermit Gosnell's House of Horrors in Philadelphia, a legally operating abortion clinic that killed women. Uh, Tanya Reeves, who died at 24 years old in a Planned Parenthood Chicago abortion clinic. So this happens regularly. But that's sort of besides the point, because the bottom line is, is the child in the womb a human life? Do they deserve legal protections? Are they human? Yes. Do they deserve protections? Yes. And abortion needs to be banned. And I believe women are strong and smart. And if they're empowered with the resources to choose life, they're not going to go to back alley abortionists. They're going to go to the people that can actually care for them, which thankfully are thousands of pregnancy resource centers across our country that outnumber abortion clinics dozens to one. Mm. I definitely want to end on that on that note, 100%. Um, let me let me give you another tough one though. Um, I'm not going to do the rape and incest one, but let's do let's do uh, the woman who is so desperately poor in such a horrific mm -hmm. life situation, uh, and also uh, I feel like something that the pro-abortion people will say is they'll characterize people like you and me, Lila, as um, thinking that people who have abortions do it flippantly, mm -hmm. and. And they're like, no, like it's painful and and it's it's horrific and, and I don't they don't want it but they need it and they feel like they're trapped and suffering and, and you're being so mean to them by telling them they're bad, and, and all, right. So how dare you judge and and uh, criticize this person for doing something who's she doesn't want to do but she's in such a desperate desperate situation she has to. What do you say about that? 
Well, first of all, if you're so desperate that you have to have an abortion, where's the choice, right? It, it, they, they say pro-choice, it's empowering to women. If you are so poor and so desperate that you feel like you have to kill your child simply to succeed in life, then that is not choice, that's desperation. So I think you have to call it for what it is that if there, you know, there are people out there that do live in fear that are struggling tremendously. Do we offer them an, a lethal option against a family member as a solution to their struggles or do we help get them out of their struggles? When a poor woman has an abortion, she's still poor afterward. If a rape survivor has an abortion, she still was a, a survivor of rape. She still was a victim of rape. If a woman who is in an abusive relationship has an abortion, she's still in an abusive, abusive relationship after that abortion. All the abortion does is make her the mother of a dead child now, and her life circumstances are all the same. So the solution and what the pro-life community does, and you know this, Mike, the pro-life community is focused on empower, truly empowering women, giving them options, helping them with their children, helping them if they choose place for adoption, helping kids in foster care. I mean, that's our focus as a movement, along with education and legal advocacy. What is the pro-abortion side doing? They're offering one choice, it's not a real choice, to kill a child. And that is no solution for any woman. Great point. Um, last point on the negative, and then we'll get to the positive. Uh, there's uh, a lie from the pro-abortion people that you won't regret it. Right? And they even like had some survey where they're like a percentage of women who had an abortion didn't regret it at all. And obviously it's a ridiculous survey, but uh, I think one of the best ministries that these pro-life centers have, one of the best, is dealing with women who've had abortions and years and decades later um, and minister to them. Um, what's your experience in this with, with yeah. knowing people who regret what they did uh, when they were told, of course, they wouldn't by the world. Yeah, well, first of all, it's it's, it's really telling that many of the pro-life organizations that exist are, are populated by women in leadership who have had abortions and they so deeply regret and are pained by that, the loss of that child, that they wanna now fight for life to prevent other women from making the same mistake. And fathers too, I mean, a lot of men involved in the movement as well. My first time praying outside an abortion clinic was with a gentleman who'd been there faithfully to offer resources to women because he told his teen girlfriend to have an abortion when he was a very young man and he just brutally regretted that. So abortion mm -hmm. regret is everywhere. They're the walking wounded, but healing is possible. There's amazing healing ministries like Rachel's Vineyard, Silent No More, there's Surrendering the Secret. We love these ministries because it says you can heal after abortion and you can put your pain to something beautiful, something good in the future to help other people. Uh, yeah. The media pro-abortion groups, they don't want to acknowledge post-abortion regret. Um, they don't want to acknowledge the emotional and psychological trauma that comes with abortion. Uh, literally women 100% more likely, 100 times more likely to um, in, have mental health issues in the years following their abortion. I mean, there's a there was a big study that um, was even reported by CBS News, but it got covered up by other media groups. So we have to talk about this because women are really hurt and affected. And the mainstream narrative is like, oh no, abortion's great. It's like getting your, your tonsils out mm -hmm. when it's really this devastating act against a child and it's devastating for women too. Um, what posture would you recommend pro-life people have as they, as we move forward in general and then as, like I said, approaching this big Supreme Court decision mm -hmm. coming up? What's the posture of a pro-lifer? Yeah, it's a great, I love that question. Um, and I do talk about this a lot in Fighting for Life. Like, what does it mean to fight for life? I mean, how do you do that in a way that's actually gonna help save lives and persuade people and be winsome? And it's a journey I'm still on and live action still on when we're reaching 15 million people weekly with pro-life education. And I think there's a few principles. First of all, I would say, go into it with an attitude of love. You know, we're here to win hearts. We're not here to beat people in a debate. Uh, you know, the pro-life case is super strong. You know, fighting for human life is, it should be obvious to all of us that that's what we should all do. Human rights begin in the womb when human life begins. It doesn't start at birth. You know, all humans have human rights, but go into it with love, with the focus of persuasion, as opposed to the focus of just proving yourself right, because that's what's actually gonna move the needle. And then I think another thing that's really key actually is for us to be educated. You know, we should take the time to study the issue, take the time to do the research, take the time to read about pro-life apologetics, fetal development, uh, risks mm. to women of abortion, uh, the, the abortion procedure. When we are empowered with the facts, we're more confident because I think sometimes pro-lifers have a confidence crisis because the world seems so hostile and the world of social media, the algorithms favor, I think, a lot of pro-abortion arguments. So, but go into it with confidence and with love and with your own 
being being equipped, equipped yourself, and then you will be a tremendous force for good to help save lives. The book will help you do it. Fighting for Life, Becoming a Force for Change in a Wounded World. Lila, I want to encourage you and everyone at Live Action. You guys are doing amazing, amazing work. I'm so grateful for you. Thank you so much. And I'd be optimistic. We're, we are seeing the beginning of the end of abortion and more and more lives are going to be saved and we all need to be in this fight. Amen to that. Uh, and I want to encourage everyone to Google your, thank you, Lila, Google your city or town and then Pro-Life Pregnancy Center and volunteer, donate, get involved with your Pro-Life Pregnancy Center in your town. They're directly saving lives and they would love your help. True story. Mike Slater, spread the word. Crusaders. As much as Biden uh, and the rest want to turn the page on Afghanistan, we will not. I saw a story the other day about how the VA, the suicide crisis hotline, received more calls than they've ever received before. Ma major uptick uh, in the last couple weeks about Afghanistan. And to help me understand why, Tommy Altman is here. He's running for Congress uh, in the second district of Virginia. That's Virginia Beach area, uh, who's a uh, vet, been in Afghanistan and Iraq as well. Tommy, how are you, brother? I'm doing well, sir. Thank you for having me. Good to talk to you. Help me understand, help a civilian understand uh, why our disastrous withdrawal, to say the least, betrayal perhaps, uh, affects someone who served in Afghanistan these last 20 years. Absolutely. Um, well, I think you, you kind of nailed it on the head right there with saying betrayal. Uh, that's what we feel. We feel betrayed by this administration. Um, and see, so, you know, when I so was in the special ops as a community of the Air Force, and so being in the special ops, what you see over there, the things that you encounter, are things that, honestly, I believe that Americans and human beings as a whole, really, we shouldn't be seeing these things. And so it just carry, you carry some of that with you when you come back home. It takes a long time to process that. It takes a long time to, to get a hold of uh, the emotion uh, that you have to process, uh, the things that you saw. And so I think what happened with this withdrawal, you want to call it that, um, what this has done is it's ripped the Band-Aid off of all that. You know, these wounds that we've been healing, these emotional wounds, we've been healing for a long time. Um, some of us going through a lot of therapy, some of us just process it this, you know, in our own ways. And it just brings all that to the, right to the surface immediately. There's no frame of reference for it. It's not something that we were anticipating. Uh, obviously, you know, I, we know that the withdrawal was, was talked about. We knew that, you know, potentially it was coming. Uh, I know a lot of Americans actually, you know, probably agree with it to some degree. And, but the way it was executed, it, it came across more as a retreat than a withdrawal from a military perspective. And if we're the superior fighting force, for us to be retreating from the Taliban, which is how we see it as, as veterans. And so, uh, man, it just it breaks your heart. You, you've been there on the ground. You've met the people. You know, you've talked to them face to face. We promised them that we would not abandon them. And we know what the Taliban is capable of. These people are absolute animals. And so we know what the Afghan people, we know what American citizens who are left behind enemy lines, we know what they're facing right now. And I'll spare your, I'll spare your viewers the description of what's happening, but uh, to, it's safe to say that it's not something that most Americans can stomach. And the things you've seen, uh, you and, and all the other guys have seen, we, we have no idea, right? We're back here in America. We never saw that stuff. We have no idea. And that's one of the problems with right. mental health, too. If you read Sebastian Younger's Tribe, uh, talks about how we don't. The rest of the people have no idea what you've seen and been through. And that creates an even more disconnect between the veteran who comes back um, now. So what are, what are we to do moving forward? What can be done? Well, I mean, I think, one, uh, as veterans, we have to reach out to each other um, and, and just reinforce to each other that this was not a failure on our part. Um, this administration may have failed us. It may have failed the Afghan people, um, but it's not a failure on our part. We still served honorably. We served well. Uh, so we need to reach out to each other because nobody else understands what you're going through um, other than other veterans. And uh, and as civilians, you know, it's important that we support you know, each other. We support um, the veterans that, honestly, we don't forget this. I really believe that this administration um, is just waiting for the news cycle to change and that hoping that we forget about 
Afghanistan, the entire debacle over there. And then we forget about the, the plight of the Afghan people now. We forget about the Americans left behind enemy lines. I mean, that's such a core part of who we are as Americans that we do not leave our own behind. We retrieve our own, the, the bodies of our fallen from the battlefield. We never leave an American behind. And so to see what's going on right now and to see how it's been whitewashed by this administration on all levels, uh, mm. it's very disheartening um, and it's discouraging. And so I think that's why you're seeing, you know, that's one of the things I talked about right away. I said, you know, the numbers are roughly 22 veterans a day give up on life. And I knew that this was going to cause so many more to do so. And I just believe that we can do a better job as a nation um, to care for those who fought for us when we need them the most. And uh, right now, uh, they're hurting. And so I really believe that we have to reach out, and you have to hold these people accountable. If you just let it go, then... Go ahead, sorry. Sorry, no, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Todd. Hey, we got to run, but I was literally just going to ask you, like, the, the fact that there's no accountability at the top. No generals uh, right. fired, no one held accountable. Uh, it makes it even worse, I'm sure. Hey, we got to run, Tommy. Uh, website, Tommy4, the number 4, VA.com, running for Congress in the 2nd District of Virginia, Virginia Beach. Tommy Altman, thank you, brother. Thank you for having me. And thank you for your service. Uh, I want to give you a, a, a little bit early preview. Coming up uh, in two days, and this weekend, we're going to do a tribute to 9-11 and talk about the inspiring lessons that we can take from it as well still today 20 years later true story mike slater spread the word